And welcome back. And we're talking about the investment summit. And uh, Dr. Tanti Mtanti from the Witt School of Governance, uh, my guest this morning. Now, Dr. Mtanti, you know, we uh, spoke about uh, what some of the conditions are, skill sets, where we need to be, where we're trying to go as a nation. But then, of course, we had the job summit recently. And you saw companies coming out, the private sector committing to working hand in hand with government in order to try and boost this economy, uh, boost uh, the economic slump, get some growth going. But uh, how difficult is it going to be for us to attract foreign direct investment when it seems as though domestically companies are not buying into what government is selling at the moment? I think it's going to be very problematic, obviously, partially because generally FDI tends to follow growth. Countries that are growing very quickly tend to attract FDI. It's that simple. We also have a different form of FDI, which is a pool. So guys will come and invest in South Africa because that's the only place where they will find platinum or where they will find iron ore. So they are coming in because the stock of natural resources is here. So in my view, Unless we can get the economy growing, unless we can get confidence in the domestic private sector uh, and start to generally accelerate the rate of change within the economy, it's going to be problematic. But how, would, how do we do that? Well, short term, it's pretty straightforward. What you've had in South Africa over the last 10 years, you've had the private sector deleveraging. Private credit extension by the banking sector has basically flatlined at about 5%. Our average over the past 100 years is about 15%, right? Immediately post-2008, you had government expenditure in real terms growing pretty quickly, partially maybe to give space to the private sector to deleverage, right? It was growing at 8 or 9% a year. But the fiscus now is strained. Government expenditure is growing at best at 2%. But the private sector is still deleveraging. Banks are still not lending. Mortgage debt as a percentage of GDP is down. Uh, household debt as a percentage of income is down. Household debt as a percentage of GDP is down. And the private sector is deleveraging. And it's not clear why. Why are banks not lending? So, so against that backdrop, you know, when you go out to the broader world there and say, you know what, South Africa is open for business. This is where you should be putting your money. And they look at all of the factors that you've just uh, outlined. They add to that some policy issues that the private sector has been uh, mm. crying about forever and a day. Mm. Why would people invest? It might be pull FDI, but it's going to be very difficult to, to try and get it right. But I, I'm just saying in terms of macroeconomic policy formulation, I don't think there's enough attention on the banks. There's enough attention on their balance sheets. There's enough attention on figuring out why they are not lending because they're basically credit rationing the rest of the economy. It's going to be pretty impossible for the economy to grow unless the banks start lending. And, um, you know, talking about the banks and lending, uh, there was um, uh, talks about a state bank, perhaps. Uh, do you think that would go some ways to perhaps alleviating that problem? Mm, yes, yeah, some way over the longer term again, but you need growth right now. I mean, Treasury has been increasing taxes. We've seen tax buoyancies down. Tax buoyancy is just taxes uh, as, a, as a percentage of well, relative to nominal GDP growth, we've seen it is pretty much down. Fiscal stabilization is a problem. The budget deficit target is missed every year. And it's going to be very difficult to bring about fiscal stabilization without the economy growing. And one of the key issues for the economy to grow is for banks to start lending to businesses for productive purposes, not for consumption for productive purposes. But if banks are credit rationing industry, if banks are credit rationing the private sector, how do you anticipate your economy to grow, especially where your fiscal space is limited? And right now, in policy formulation, nobody is answering why, since 2008, bank credit extension to the private sector has reduced to an average of 5% from a historical average of 15%. 
The U.S. suffered the same fate, but their banks started lending in 2012, 2013. That's why the economy is growing. In South Africa, they're not lending. Well, and uh, I'm hoping someone would answer that question. Uh, we'll actually listen out as to whether anyone tackles that particular issue. But also, um, this comes again after the medium-term budget policy uh, statement by the Minister of Finance. And you spoke about growth and mm. how investment will follow growth. Mm. But we just had our growth uh, rate revised downwards to 0.7%. Yes. Well, I think the revisions will carry on, pointing largely down, partially because, look, government is a substantial percentage of the economy. The private sector is over 60% of the economy. If both those two entities don't have money, <laughs> the economy can function. It's a problem. You can't have government deleveraging at the same time as the private sector is deleveraging. So this investment summit, do you think it will achieve its objective? Long term, like I said, I think it's something positive if it's calibrated correctly. It's not emphasizing once again investment into the mining sector, investment into the agricultural sector where the country has proven capabilities. If it can assist the country diversify its economic base, China has done it very well. It places conditions on FDI. It, it demands that the MNCs that come in train its workers. It demands that they partner with, its, with, the, with the Chinese companies and that there is technology transfer. And in turn, it, it gets to develop capabilities in industries it wouldn't have had. Unless FDI fosters technological progress and the diversification of the economy, it is completely irrelevant for growth. And uh, perhaps just finally, with all the commissions of inquiry, you know, talk about uh, curtailing corruption, do you think that will go at least some ways uh, to assisting those who are trying to bring foreign investment to the country? Longer term, I think institutional factors matter, uh, issues of corruption. But the country that has traditionally had the highest levels of perception of corruption in China has attracted the most foreign in direct investment. Foreign direct investors, like every company owner, want to make money, period. They want to make a profit. If they are coming into a place where they can't make money, if they can't make a profit, they're not going to invest. The country could be run by the Pope. If they can't make money, they're not interested. And we've got to get our economy growing so that foreign investors can believe they will come in here and make some money. And in turn, they will come. But they also need to come on our terms. They don't need to come here to invest in sectors where we've got capabilities. They need to come. Remember, their interest is not necessarily to develop the country. Their interest is to come here and make money. Yeah. Well, Dr. Uh, Tanti Mtanti, thanks so much uh, from the uh, Witt School of Governance, uh, giving a perspective on the investment summit uh, that kicks off today, and uh, as this especially in the context of our current economic woes. And as he says, uh, I suppose the bottom line there is investors are not philanthropic. They're not coming here to necessarily help poor African children. They're coming here because there's money to be made. Let's